too hard for the Yankees as I wear my Mets tie there. <laughs> so, you know, so thank you for that um, warm welcome. And I thank you, you know, to Lou and to Stacy and to all the Greater Bangington Chamber of Commerce for putting on an event like this. I think given uh, a large scale positive event that occurred yesterday and all be related to this topic and to have this meeting here and hopefully there will be more meetings and more large positive events because I think my job is to talk a little bit about small business, a little, about, a little bit about where I think this is in Albany and what all of us collaboratively, cohesively, collectively can do to get this done and to get it across the goal line. So I know I'm the only thing between all fresh air and uh, all of you, so just give me 10 minutes. Um, I think I have some important things to say. NFIB is a national organization. We represent small and independent businesses. But by independent, I mean not publicly traded. So I have Amish, I represent farmers, I have liquor stores, restaurants, hotels, and global manufacturers. I have members that would directly benefit from the safe development of shale gas in New York. I would have members that would benefit indirectly. I represent over 10,000 small businesses in the state of New York. Truly, I believe it's Main Street. We are a member-driven organization, and by member-driven, I don't need to go out to my members and ask them what they think about 15% tax increase. I don't need to ask them where they are with expansion of prevailing wage or minimum wage. But for issues like hydraulic fracturing, we did two years ago, and 73% support. It's not 73% of Southern Tier, that's 73% of the small businesses that I represent across the state because they understand the benefit that this has for them directly and indirectly as it relates to their energy costs and in many ways that have been described already. But public policy, and this isn't unique to New York, is riddled with overused buzzwords and catchphrases. And I'm as guilty as anyone. I use them all the time. But think about the last two years in New York. How many times have you heard a business leader? Have you heard a, uh, one of your representatives in Albany, whether it's the Assembly or the Senate or the Governor, say New York is open for business? Heard it on TV. You've heard it on the radio. Does anybody in this room think New York is open for business? No. Right, because last week when a report came out about the Tax Foundation, that New York went from 49th to 50th. And I publicly stated that means New York's now in business. The government really didn't like that very much. So that's the point. We're talking about New York being open for business. We're talking about finding that silver bullet, that magical mystery tour that everybody, every governor in the last 30, 40 years has looked for to rejuvenate the upstate economy, to help Southern Tier, to drastically push the trajectory of economic development in the state in a new direction, well, they have one that's under our feet. When you look at the potential, the untapped potential that would jumpstart this economy, and in one safe and sensible swoop, we would be able to revitalize, uh, particularly a region that really needs it, and the fact that we have waited four years and that's four years since the moratorium was put in place, including the time that the governor has went through this comprehensive review process. At last check, we had 9.1% unemployment statewide. And 95% of our natural gas needs in the state is imported from somewhere outside of our world. Now, I have that data too, but these guys are in the industry, so if I'm off by a little bit, bear with me. But I'm using what I've been speaking about for a while. While we wait and slumber for this issue to take off, uh, we have the opportunity, if allowed, to spur $11.4 billion in new economic output, create anywhere, and these are all conservative estimates, between 15,000 and 35,000 jobs, and generate $1.4 billion in state and local tax revenue. It's $1.4 billion in state and local tax revenue, where if you've read a paper in the last 10 days, you have seen that there are municipalities, there are school districts in every part of the state that are rapidly approaching a fiscal cliff that's going to decimate them. 
You had mayors in Syracuse and in Yonkers and other places that are clamoring for real comprehensive mandate relief because of pension costs and health care costs. This is 1.4 billion the state of New York does not have. This is 1.4 billion that municipalities and school districts will share, and that will allow us to avoid that fiscal cliff. So while I and other business leaders have talked about mandate relief, this is a way that you know maybe they could dodge half of a bullet so they could provide that financial flexibility for our communities. They talked about the jobs that are created and those that uh, dispute this think jobs are not created, so I'm not going to rehash them, but I had the same statistics that the Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry used. Um, so what do we do? If anyone in this room can accurately predict what the next few months are going to hold for hydraulic fracturing in New York, I'll take a recommendation to allow our tickets out. Because when we heard in August that it was going to be Labor Day, and then Labor Day came and went, and then we heard we are going to do a health review, what is the result of the health review? And then, of course, in the end of November, if they don't come out with their health review, there's this, there's this date that will start all over again. And we'll have another problem coming. And somebody will come up with something else to study. And then we will wait in perpetuity. But I don't believe the state can, can hold on that long financially. I don't believe the economy of the state can hold on. And that's why I'm here today. Publicly, I have supported the governor's methodology if they went through this comprehensive process. I also agree with his comments recently that regardless of what the end result is, there will be a cloud of litigation that will stretch for miles. Either way. And he's right. And so if they're going to do this health study to kind of help soften that, and I'm pretty sure that when we were talking earlier in the table, I'm pretty sure that this was going on the whole time the DDC was reviewing this. Okay. What needs to happen, and it goes back, that there needs to be a public discourse, a public dynamic that needs to be different than what we've seen the last year and a half. The industry and business leaders, small, medium, and large, municipal leaders, school leaders, concerned taxpayers, everybody who supports hydraulic fracturing in the state of New York, shale gas development, <coughs> needs to come together, go to Albany, do it here, do it in Syracuse, do it in Jamestown, and push loudly, because the other side has done that effectively. Have any of you ever been to Albany on a Tuesday when the legislature's in session? You seen the charter buses rolling? Hundreds of people with bullhorns and signs and progressive shirts? And you're a business owner? Well, nothing usually when they get off the bus you would like. Because it's taxes. It's increased taxes. It's anti shale gas, anti-shale development. And in my 10, 12 years of public policy, I've never seen an issue more divisive, with more fiery rhetoric, with the perpetration of lies, as I have seen with hydrocarbon. And it's not stop. But they have done a good job out of the gate, and we have not. I, my colleagues and partners in this state, no offense to you guys, and I do not believe we messed this right out of the gate in New York. As I tell my counterparts who like to point their finger and laugh at me from Pennsylvania and in West Virginia, they say, hey, you guys keep taking your time, we'll just keep reaping the benefits. The pro fracker in New York is different than the pro fracker in West Virginia. The pro fracker in New York is different from that in Pennsylvania. But it doesn't mean it can't happen. It doesn't mean it shouldn't happen. And it doesn't mean if we have more days like yesterday that the governor, his staff, and members of the legislature won't wake up and realize there is a large segment of New Yorkers that support this, that want this, and need this. It has an opportunity, as discussed, about jobs for the small business owner. If they're not directly involved as manufacturers, they will be. Because how many pots of coffee will those working on these, on these wells need? How many steaks will they consume? How many beers, as you said, will they drink? How many hotel rooms will they stay in? Every small, medium, large hardware store is going to be used for supplies to go to those working or to those that just bought a home. The induced economic benefit of, of shale development in this state is endless, not only for the small business here in this region, but throughout the entire state. Energy costs, you think about the 95% I said, uh, I think it was described very well that re importing our gas, and toll types seem to be something I'm talking about a lot, each state it goes through. 
It's an increased cost to ultimately lands to you. And because we are New York, anytime there's an energy cost, there's an assessment usually added to it. If there's not one you know about, I guarantee you, if you took a magnifying glass to your bill, you'd see some. Because that's the reality of the state. But this is an opportunity to reverse that trend. So again, um, collaboratively, cohesively, collectively. Too often when I go to rooms like this, I talk about any likely it's been minimum wage in the toll height or it's the tax foundation report. When I go to a room and I take a baseball bat and I swing and I urge them all to be motivated and energized, it goes two ways. The first one, uh, people, my members or, or business owners will raise their hands up in the air and they'll say, well, that's just New York. That's Albany. I can imagine it's not going to change anything. But that defeats his amazing honor. The other way it will go is a room where we all be energized, they'll be willing to work together. They're all excited. They're going to come to Albany to hang out with me and Bobby and the members. They're going to write letters to the editor. They're going to vlog. They're going to tweet. They're going to do whatever else that they do. And then they leave and they go home and they have dinner with their wife or their husband. Maybe their kids had detention that day. They got a nasty bill on the mail. Their business has some issues. And everything that they were energized about that would help propel their financial future for them, their family, their business, their employees, is forgotten. So that's not going to work either. So I do urge all of you to understand that the lobbyists, the industry, CEOs, they're not going to get this across the finish line, individually or collectively. They need all of you. They need the actual business owner, the taxpayer, the homeowner, the resident of the state to come together to work with me, to work with them, to work with their chamber, to work with any organization that, you represent, that, you, that you're a part of to get this across. Because this is a fight that the landowners, the farmers, the small business owners will win if we do it together. So I thank you. I try to encourage a lot. I know we've talked a lot of things. I try not to be too much of a bombastic bully. But I just really needed to paint a picture that this is what is happening in Albany. This is where it stands. It is sort of stagnant. But we do have an opportunity to push it across the goal. So thank you.